Why the fuck? Hello, everyone. Just wait a sec. Hi, Cooper. Hi, Austin. Diana. Hi. Hi, Michelle. Just waiting for our presenter to come on. Oh my gosh, there's a lot of people here. Holy cow. This is exciting. Is I don't see Terry Kearns on here yet. So we'll just have to wait. And I think Samantha is coming as well. Samantha, are you Partnership Carson City? Yay, there's a lot of people on here, I'm excited. So I'm just waiting for Terry. Um, Terry Kearns is our guest speaker tonight. She'll be talking about the opioid crisis. So um, I'm just kind of waiting on here for her. Hopefully she'll be jumping on in any second. <laughs> How's everyone doing? Gianna, did you get my email about the drug project? No, but I figured it out. Okay, good. Austin, I see you and your mom there. Good job. <laughs> Wonder if I should call her. Just a I think you should. Pardon? I think you should. Yeah, let me do that. Well, thank you for all coming. Hi, Angie. Hi. <laughs> I didn't see any of my students on there yet. Oh, they'll show up. They better. <laughs> I know Samantha emailed her today, and we've been talking all day long, but I don't, don't see her on there yet. Oh, yeah, she just joined. Oh, good. Yay. Hello, Terry. Oh, she's just joining right now. Mm -hmm. Okay. Can you hear me? There you are. Hi, how are you? Yeah, sorry. I was having some technical difficulties. I know. That's okay. <laughs> All right. Diana's here too. Good, Diana. So um, I want to welcome everybody to tonight's family engagement series and it's in partnership with um, or it's in conjunction with partnership Carson City and Carson High School, as well as um, COVID-19. Um, so we have a couple of presenters. One is Diana and she works with partnership Carson City, as well as Terry Kearns and I'll introduce her, but I'll let her go more in depth into her, her role and her job, but she is with um, the Attorney General's Office, and she has um, been appointed the Opioid Task Force. So she'll be talking to you guys tonight about opioids, what they are, and the dangers of them, and possible um, 
use during this lockdown that we're all in. So um, I think we'll first start with Diana. Can you hear me if I talk through the computer? Yes. Okay, because my audio sometimes doesn't go through, so. <laughs> no, you're good. So while Diana's pulling it up, if you have any questions down at the bottom of your screen, there's chat. If you kind of ho hover down there at the bottom and you have a question, you can type it into chat. Um, reactions, you can also raise your little blue hand there or you can wave too. So if you want to do that, you can, but that will be at the bottom of your screen. Okay, can everyone see my screen? Yes. Okay, I'm going to leave it just like this because if I go into slideshow, my computer will completely freeze. So I'm just going to go ahead and do it like that. Perfect. Okay. Um, I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, so my name is Diana Alonzo and I'm with Partnership Carson City. I am their Hispanic Outreach Coordinator and Community Health Worker. Oh, see, it's going to freeze. Uh-oh. <laughs> there you go. Okay, there you go. So what is naloxone? So naloxone, um, also known as Narcan, is a medication used to counter the effects of an opioid overdose. So naloxone only works if the person has opioids in their system if they don't have, if the opioid is absent, then it doesn't work. So for example, if someone um, maybe is overdosing on maybe a different kind of drug, but not an opioid, so such as like heroin, um, prescription pills, um, then anything without the opioid wouldn't work. Um, and then naloxone has no potential for abuse. Um, naloxone can be injected in the muscle, vein, or under the skin, or sprayed into the nose. Um, the most common way you'll see it is the nasal spray. Um, a lot of people don't feel comfortable injecting something, um, so the nasal spray is not really um, to go. So the first thing you want to do is check for a response. So give the person a light shake, see the person's name, give them a firm um, stern rub, so that's if you like make your hand into a fist and then the knuckles you rub kind of like on your chest, like the muscle. Um, if you do it like now, it doesn't feel very pleasant. Um, if the person does not respond, so they don't wake up, they don't stay awake, um, go ahead and administer naloxone and then call 911. So you remove naloxone from the nasal, you remove the nasal spray from the box um, so that's what it looks like. You peel, it's in a little, um, tub, so it's completely, like, secure and everything. Um, you hold the nasal spray with your thumb on the bottom, and then you just spray it as you were, um, it's kind of like the flu shot, if any of you have ever gotten it, like, through the nasal spray, it's the same thing. Um, don't test the device, it's a one-time use, so if you, like, spit out half of it, then the other half, the person gets to use, um, and then you just put it in through one nostril. Um, and then what to do after um, you administer naloxone. So you continue doing chest compressions or rest your breath. If you do not have a face mask, do not give rest your breath. They're okay if you do just chest compressions. Um, we say that for your safety and your safety uh, is a priority in this. So if you do have a mask and you feel comfortable, you can go ahead and do rest your breath. Um, and then if not, go ahead and do chest compression. And then if you don't have a reaction within two or three minutes, um, or that person stops breathing again, you can go ahead and give them another dose of naloxone. Again, you can't overdose on naloxone. Um, and something I will add, um, most people ask if they should refrigerate it or 
what kind of temperature they should leave it at. Don't put it in the fridge because if you give someone the locks and it's been in the fridge, all you're going to do is give them really bad brain freeze and it's not going to feel pleasant. Um, again, don't leave it in a super hot, like hot car here in Arizona. Don't leave that in your car. If something's going to melt, it's, it's going to melt it. Um, if you do need to walk away for whatever reason, go ahead and put them um, in this position. So you're going to roll them to the side. We use their hand as support and their knee from their, their knee stops the body from rolling onto their stomach. And we do this um, as a as a prevention method um, that person chokes on their own vomit. Hannah, this is Hannah. I'm really sorry to interrupt, but I think we have a couple people who need to mute themselves because we are picking up a little bit of background noise when you talk. So it looks like we have Angie that might need to um, mute herself and someone else. So if you all could just go ahead and check, make sure you have a line going through your microphone. Um, it might reduce some of that echoing if you're hearing that when Diana talks. Perfect. Thanks, um, so where can I get naloxone? So you can always get naloxone um, with us at Partnership Carson City. Um, that's 1925 North Carson Street. Um, you can also get at your sheriff's department. So the Carson City Sheriff's Office has it. And then your local prescription drug roundups. We do those twice a year. We don't think we one in April, but unfortunately, um, due to um, COVID-19, we're not able to have one this year. So hopefully we'll make something up and do something just local here. Um, and then we'll do the other one hopefully in October um, as planned. Um, yeah, does anybody have any questions? And that's all my information. Again, my name is Diana. And I, I like this presentation. Good job on it. Um, I do have a question. So you said it's available at the Sheriff's Department as well as Partnership Carson City. Does it cost anything to pick up? It does not with us. You can also get them at pharmacies, um, but at pharmacies, you do have to pay. So if you go through like the sheriff's department or you go through us, it does not cost any money. And then I just have one more question. So you, do you keep a record? Like, would you take my name down and say, I picked up nalox naloxone? Um, no, so uh, normally um, you'll walk in and I'm normally the person sitting at the front. So you'll definitely see me there. Um, and you'll just say, oh, I need another bag of naloxone, mine expired, or I used mine, I, can I have another bag or so, and we'll go ahead and just give you one without any questions on. So I thought it was only available by prescription, so I'm confused as to, you know, how you guys are giving it out. Um, this is Hannah. I can go ahead and answer that question. So Partnership Carson City, along with um, a few other places in Nevada, has become a distribution center for naloxone. So through a fantastic grant that Cassatt and UNR have, they've been, have been able to receive free naloxone and be able to train and then disperse it in the community. So we are a certified trainer and disbursement center, and it does not require having insurance or a fee assessed to it. And it's all thanks to grant funds, of course. And once the grant funds go away, a free service like that does go away. In the beginning, it did start as a prescription-based program, but due to the simplicity of its nature um, and how easy it is to use and how easy it is to administer, it has become a free program. So we're really grateful for that opportunity. And I'm going to piggyback on what you just said. Um, Courtney Dickerson also, Dicker Dickinson said Pace Coalition and Elko is also a distribution site. So um, along with Partnership Carson City and Sheriff's Department. I don't know if Douglas has it. I know they have a partnership down there, but I don't know if they are a site that distributes it. I do not believe that Partnership Douglas County is a distribution center yet. And we do highly suggest that rather than going to the sheriff's office to pick it up, that you do come to us. Their supply is always first hand to the officers and second to the community. Us, we can give it to the community right away. No questions asked. You can come in and get it for yourself or for anyone else in your household. And it's important to remember that 
having naloxone or Narcan, it's a um, generic name, you do not have to have someone who's an addict in your household. I keep it in my household because I have young children and should my husband and I ever be prescribed something, we wanna have the safety net just in case. So remember, this is not only for an addict who's overdosing. This is for any household, no different than you have Benadryl when you have allergies or you have an EpiPen. If you have a severe allergy, this is a protective mechanism to save lives. That's a good point, Hannah. Um, Linda Lang also wrote, most coalitions in the state can access and distribute for free. And Linda also, she used to work for partnerships at Carson City, but does no longer, right, Hannah? So Linda Lang is the director of the Nevada Statewide Coalition, which if you want to think of it in a simple way, like how you have Carson City School District and then you have all the other little schools under it, she is essentially our coalition district and then all of us coalitions are under her. She helps lead and guide us through the state and brings in um, funding that all of us coalitions can utilize together. So she did used to work for PCC and the NSCP, but now she's just NSCP. Thank if you. you ever have questions for other counties and you don't know who to reach, she is your go-to woman. Awesome. I know she does a lot of good work, so thank you, Linda. Um, we do have another question in the chat. Since repeated snorting of drugs leads to damage of the nasal lining, does this affect the efficiency of or efficacy of the nasal spray of naloxone? Um, no, it doesn't, I believe. Um, the only thing the Loxone needs is it just needs to go into the airway. It just needs to be breathed in. So whether it's damaged or not, it just needs to be um, breathable in. Okay, does anyone else have any questions? If not, um, thank you again for Diana. You did a great job and Hannah for um, kicking in there. Um, so we will move over to our opioid presentation by Terry Kearns. And the last thing that I would like to mention is that if anyone on here does want to get Narcan naloxone um, right away, we are providing it through the mail. So we it'll come from us. We can mail it to your house. Um, you don't have to wait to get it. So if that is something you'd like, please go ahead and email Miss Bean and um, give her your address and we will go ahead and mail it to you. Okay, so thank you, Hannah. Um, and Carrie, are you ready for your presentation? We're, we're so happy to have you, so thank you very much. <laughs> sure, no problem at all. Um, I'll introduce myself in just a second, but I wanted to add something to the conversation on the uh, needing of a prescription for naloxone. So within our state, two legislative sessions ago, a couple of different legislations were passed. One was, it's known as Assembly Bill 474, which is the Prescription Drug Monitoring Program, and then also the Good Samaritan Drug Overdose and Act. And as part of those that legislation, uh, it changed it so you no longer have to have a prescription for naloxone and uh, the distribution through the coalitions and through health departments and various other agencies like the sheriff's office is done under the auspices of the chief medical officer with the state uh, public and behavioral health. So that's how it can be administered. And additionally, as part of that legislation, it was also say that my physician prescribes me an opiate over an opiate prescription. I can also have someone in my, uh, like my significant other or someone in my house who can get the naloxone in the event of an accidental overdose as well. So I just wanted to add that so that everyone knows legislatively how it is that we can now have uh, naloxone without a prescription. My name is Terry Kearns and uh, as I was introduced previously, I do work for the Attorney General's office here in the state of Nevada, but um, my position is grant funded through some of that funding that uh, Hannah talked about. And it's through funding from the Department of Public and Behavioral Health. And my background is I was a practicing nurse for 11 years, almost 11 years. And then I worked in federal law enforcement for 21 years. So um, 
public and behavioral health wanted to have someone who, if you will, spoke both languages, spoke healthcare language, and also spoke law enforcement, so that I could sit in the attorney general's office and try to get a lot of the programs that are being done from first responders, law enforcement, and public health and healthcare and get um, those going in the same direction. So I've been in the position since October of 2017. And, um, and I say my job description is changing hearts and minds. So it's uh, really um, a lot of criminal justice reform, getting law enforcement first responders to really look at, uh, at addiction not so much as a social um, or a personal flaw, but rather as the disease that it's, it is. So I'm gonna talk about that today. I'm gonna to talk about addiction, understanding what the difference between tolerance, dependence, and addiction is. We'll talk about a dopamine and how, whether it's opiates, whether it's stimulants, um, how that affects the brain. And then we'll also talk about some of the uh, different uh, statistics with our, in our state and then I want to end it up by telling you some of the things that we have been doing in the state since the COVID-19 uh, restrictions have been put in place because um, with both substance use disorder and a lot of the mental health disorders, one of the um, hardest things is isolation and that lack of connectedness. So a lot of programs have been put in place to try to help people that are, are newly into recovery um, or that do have substance use disorders so that they can have the assistance that they need. So one of the things that we talk about is why do we study drug use and addiction? And one of the is, now this statistic's about a year old, but um, it, the use and misuse of drugs in the United States has cost Americans about $700 billion a year. And as we look at that, that's a, a big cost. But the bigger cost to us is that illicit and prescription drugs have uh, contributed to tens of thousands of um, deaths per year, both in our, our state and then throughout the United States. So the problem with that is that someone may initially take a drug and it may be voluntary, but um, the statistics and studies have shown that most people, if they knew they would end up addicted, would not have taken that drug voluntarily. And with continued use, a person's ability to exert self-control can really become critically impaired. And that's really the hallmark of addiction. And brain studies, which now um, our medical professionals do have the capability through CAT scans, PET scans, and other different kinds of scans to image the brain. And that's really made us understand that addiction is a brain disease or a brain disorder. And it really affects the critical areas of the brain that are critical to judgment, learning and memory, and behavioral control. And that really is what leads to that impulsive nature of addiction. So often I get asked, why do some people become addicted to medications and others don't? And it really does differ from person to person. There's really no one single determinant of why one person will become addicted and another person doesn't. But we have found through um, studies that the more risk factors a person has, the greater their chances of taking drugs will lead to addiction. And then the more protective factors that someone has, it really reduces that person's um, chance of becoming addicted to drugs. And some examples of risk factors and then the, the opposite protective factors that we see are a risk factor is aggressive behavior in children. A protective factor is good self-control. A risk factor is lack of parental supervision. And a protective factor is parental monitoring and support. A risk factor is poor social skills. And a protective factor is positive relationships. A risk factor is drug experimentation. And a protective factor is someone who uh, achieves to get good grades. Another risk factor is the availability of drugs at school, and a protective factor is school anti-drug policies. And then the last one I want to talk about is a risk factor is community poverty versus a protective factor of having uh, great neighborhood resources, such as uh, partnership uh, Carson City. So one of the things that we found is through not just the brain imaging, but also through genetic um, testing 
Um, a lot of you are already familiar with genetic testing, whether it's uh, Ancestry or like uh, uh, 23andMe. Both of those do genetic testing and, uh, you know, that can tell you about your background, can tell you about predisposition for certain diseases. But they also look at that genetic um, makeup. And there are people that have a certain genetic makeup that make them more prone to becoming addicted. And part of that is um, their genetic code, but it's also how they respond to that dopamine that we'll talk about in the brain. Um, but that doesn't, just because you have that genetic factor doesn't mean that you would become addicted to drugs, but it, uh, it is a risk factor to it. Um, there is brain imaging, and what they found is that, that certain genetic types will uptake dopamine in the brain a lot easier than other genetic types. So that's one of the things that we see. There were also some tests done with adolescents who smoke cannabis and finding an increased risk of schizophrenic disorder depending on their genetic makeup. So um, that is documented uh, research that has been done. So I want to talk to you a little bit about the brain because as I explained to you, um, substance use disorder is a brain disease. And within our brain, we have certain um, different functions that, uh, that happen automatically that we don't even have to think about. And that pathway is what um, oftentimes is involved with uh, substance use disorder. So if you think back, think back about when we were learning about uh, cavemen and women, they had that uh, drive to hunt in order to get food. Well, whenever they would hunt and they got food, they would get a release of dopamine in their brain. So that would really embed that you hunt, you get food, you eat. So that would drive that behavior again. So you would want to hunt again. So it's a very, really primitive um, activity that happens in our brain. In our brain. And uh, different uh, structures are involved with that. Um, but the main functions are the structures that we see in the brain are the reward pathway. It's what we call the ventric ventricular tegmental area, BTA, the nucleus accumbens, we call that the NA, and then the prefrontal cortex are also involved in that. And what we find is that, especially with opiates, when someone takes an opiate, they bind in the brain and they bind in the brain across this reward pathway that we just talked about. So within your brain, you have um, dopamine that's released. It goes across a receptor and then it's picked up by the dopamine receptors. And um, as Diane was talking about naloxone, naloxone blocks those dopamine receptors or those opiate receptors. So that's why naloxone would reverse opiates where it wouldn't for stimulants or other drugs. It would only work because it binds at that opiate receptor in the brain. And that's how naloxone works. So within our bodies, um, part of the reason that we take opiates is to relieve pain. So we have the pain pathway in the, in the brain. So think about something, for example, if you put your fingers on a hot stove, you will feel pain in your fingers that pain response goes through your nerves, up through your spinal cord, and up into the brain. This all happens in fractions of a second, nanoseconds. And then your brain would send a response back down to the spinal cord and back through those nerves to your hand, causing you to lift your hand off of that hot stimulus. So that's how um, all of this happens within the body. Um, so there is, like I said, a functional use there are prescription opiates that do help to relieve pain. That's one example. And this is really a very simplistic um, example of pain in the body. But there's bind binding of opiate and opiate receptors that we talked about in the brain. And that's what really causes the side effects. So depending on the side effects, um, the worse they become, that's what causes what we call an overdose. So you have mu receptors in your body, and these are in, in the skin, in your organs, in joints, they're all throughout your body. And they call that, cause that analgesic effect, which we want. That's a good effect of, of opiates, for example. 
but they can also cause tolerance dependence, which we'll talk about later, constipation, nausea, and vomiting. Some people can't take opiates because they get nausea and vomiting. And then the really bad one that leads to the overdose is respiratory depression. And that also is seen in the delta um, receptors that are throughout the body is that uh, side effect of respiratory depression. What we found is that back in the late 1990s, um, there was, prior to that time, most prescribers were pretty uh, stringent in prescribing opiates to people because of the high potential for addiction. And so in the 1990s, pharmaceutical companies started, um, said they had studies that showed that uh, opiates were not as addictive as what we thought, and they did a hard press um, push with prescribers to increase the prescribing of opiates. So in 1999, we started seeing an increase in the prescribing of opiates for pain, and subsequently, if you look at the line, I know I don't have the presentation up for you, but if you looked at the line underneath that, you see prescriptions being increasing, increasing from 1999 to present day. You also see a parallel increase of overdose deaths from opiates. So um, that was the unfortunate part of the increased prescribing. Uh, there is that potential for addiction that we have found. So we'll talk about tolerance, dependence, and addiction, and the difference between those three because there is really a significant difference. Tolerance is a state in which an organism no longer responds to a drug, and you need a higher dose of that to achieve the same effect. So I know myself, I'm a coffee drinker. I need my cup of coffee in the morning. You can get caffeine, whether it's through uh, coffee or energy drinks, those sorts of things. We take that first uh, drink of coffee or those first cups in order to really um, give the effects. It's a lesser effect than what we see with opiates, but it does give you, picks you up a little bit. So if that one cup of coffee doesn't do it for us anymore in the morning and we start to need two to three to four, that's an example of tolerance that you see. Um, and Tolerance does affect the brain. It affects the brain area. I told you that VTA, ventricular tegmental area, over to the nucleus accumbens. That's where the interference occurs in the brain, where we need more of whatever that drug is, whether it's uh, caffeine, opiates, stimulants, whatever it is, to get the same effect. So that's tolerance. Then we go into dependence. Dependence to a drug is a state in which an organism functions normally, only in the presence of that drug. And if you take that drug away, again, whether it's caffeine, nicotine, opiates, whatever, if you take that drug away, there will be physical disturbances when that drug is removed, and that's known as withdrawal. If anyone's ever tried to stop taking caffeine, you'll notice you get a little jittery, you get a little anxiety feeling, and that is an example of withdrawal. It's much less in caffeine than what it is in opiates and other stimulants, but that is dependence and that would be uh, the withdrawal that you would feel. So now there's two areas of the, the brain that are affected with um, dependence. We talked about that VTA to nucleus accumbens, that was the area of the brain that's affected with tolerance. Now that same area is affected with dependence, but also uh, part of the brainstem is also involved. So we now have two areas that are affected in the brain when we move from tolerance to dependence. And then when we go to addiction, addiction is, is described or defined as a chronic relapsing brain disease that's characterized by compulsive drug seeking and use despite the harmful consequences. And it is considered a brain disease because as I told you, it does have the effect in the brain. And those, cha those changes in the brain can be long lasting and they can lead to harmful behaviors. So now with tolerance, we had the one area, the VTA to the nucleus accumbens that was affected. With uh, dependence, it was that VTA to nucleus accumbens and also the brain stem. And then with addiction, you also have those two areas that are affected, but the prefrontal cortex. 
And what that prefrontal cortex does is it now embeds memories. So like I use the example of cavemen that would hunt and um, they would eat, they'd get the release of dopamine, and then they would remember that. That's where that happens is that pre prefrontal cortex in the brain. So um, now we have basically accelerated to changes in the brain um, it's defined as addiction, and that's why it's considered a brain disease. So addiction, there are physical um, uh, uh, characteristics, but most of the diagnosis of addiction is behavioral based. And some examples of that are social or interpersonal problems related to use, neglect major roles um, in life, uh, use larger amounts for longer, repeated attempts to control the use or to quit. You spend a lot of time using or trying to get the drugs to use. And then you'll give up activities in order to um, basically seek that drug or take that drug. So those are some of the behavioral based. Um, the dopamine production that occurs in the brain occurs, if you think about it, think about whatever your best day was that you ever had, whether that was graduating or getting married or a birth of a child on the best day ever think of the amount of dopamine that's released as maybe the size of a golf ball that's just an analogy but that's to size it now dopamine uh, production when someone uses marijuana is not quite double that so think of instead of a golf ball now maybe the size of a baseball and then heroin the release of dopamine in the brain is now we're talking about maybe the size of a big beach ball. And then for methamphetamine, the amount of dopamine that is released in the brain is like instead of uh, the baseball, the whole baseball field. So you can see different drugs or chemicals in the brain cause a different amount of dopamine to be released. And that's why with things such as heroin or methamphetamine, um, people need to take more and more as they build that tolerance because they don't get that same amount of dopamine release that they did when they first started taking it. There is a phrase they call tracing, chasing the dragon. And what that means is a person will never forget that same high they did when they first took it because they see it takes more in order to get that same dopamine uh, production or release in the brain. And the analogy I use, I like to use analogies, that's kind of how I think, is that if anyone's ever lived, say, in a home that's next to a highway or next to train tracks, and when you first move there, you can hear the noise from that highway or from the trains going by all the time. It may wake you up, it may disturb you, but over time, it seems like you stop hearing it because it becomes like white noise. You get used to hearing it. That's the same way that the brain responds to these drugs. They take them and that same noise level becomes less and less in the brain because it's kind of like that background white noise that, that people hear. So um, what we've also found is that different drugs, not only does it produce that dopamine in the brain, but it will produce that, cause that reaction to start at different times in the brain, some quicker than others. And then the effects of that dopamine in the brain will last different times. An example I'll give you is um, through studies that have been done, they've found that if someone eats food, they'll have a release of dopamine. And it will be at about probably the 40 minute uh, point that they'll spike, or they'll spike in the amount of dopamine. And they spike up to like 150 nanograms. So that happens at about 40 minutes. And then out over 180 minutes, they come back down close to that baseline where they were before they ate the food and had the release of dopamine. Someone who has marijuana, um, takes marijuana in, at about 20 minutes, so much faster, they see that spike in dopamine. And that spikes up to about the same, about 150 nanograms as what you saw with food and it lasts out to only 80 minutes. So it comes back to baseline much faster than what you see with food. And then with methamphetamines, that baseline at about 40 minutes, again, you see the peak or the spike. 
but it spikes almost 10 times what you see with food and marijuana and spikes to up to over a thousand nanograms. So they get a much bigger flood of dopamine in the brain. And then it takes a long time. It'll start to come down quickly, but then slowly, gradually over about the next five hours where that dopamine comes back to baseline. So you can see it's a much higher spike over a longer period of time. So, and this has all been shown with studies. One of the other things that um, we talk about, I told you it's a chronic brain disease, substance use disorder and addiction. So think of it like if someone has heart disease. If someone has heart disease, when you see a good, healthy heart, you see it on the imaging that they do, the studies, you see a lot of good activity. And on these different studies that they use, typically good activity is really uh, shown up with a lot of red in those different scans we see. But someone who has cardiac disease or heart disease, you'll see less and less red and more yellows and greens because their heart doesn't function as well. Well, we found the same thing when they do these imagings with the brain, whether it's alcohol, cocaine, or heroin, that someone uh, before they are addicted, they have that good activity that's evidenced by the red on these imaging studies. But as they get into chronic use and become addicted, there's really not much red activity um, and it shows a diseased organ or a diseased brain, just like in heart disease, and you would see that same thing so happening. Terry, Terry um, we had a question. Austin has a few questions that he's put out, but I think you just answered um, Austin's really good question. Um, the feeling of the high you get from dopamine or marijuana or um, meth that you were talking about, um, or opioids, is that occur only with addiction, or is it immediately with that introduction. I think you kind of hit on that with Chasing the Dragon. The second question he had was, um, can people get the same high from food and marijuana when they have a certain amount of it? Uh, so they'll get a high, but it will not be the same high as what you see with methamphetamines or with opiates. It's a much higher because you have significantly more, like I said, about 10 times more release of dopamine where you would never have that same high release of dopamine, it would be about 10 times less um, from what you would see with food or marijuana. And um, along that same line, there are a lot of people in this state, in Carson City in the United States, who are chronic pain patients who are on prescription opiates, for example. Those people may never ever go to addiction they, may, they will become tolerant, they will have to have those medications, but they still can function, they have an improved quality of life, some can hold jobs, some you know, can take care of themselves, other things, but they never ever go over past the tolerance and the dependence into addiction. So, and that's where I got into it is, it's really person by person, some of it's genetic, some of it's our, our um, environment. So we, we can't really predict who will become addicted or who won't. But people can be tolerant on opiates, for example, of, of pain medications and never become addicted to those um, medications. That answer the question? Yes, thank you very much, Terry. Yeah. You're welcome. Austin, good Sorry. question. Um, so one of the other problems that we see with addiction and chronic drug use is it does affect other systems in the body, depending on how it's taken. I know when Diane was given the presentation on naloxone use, somebody had the question of, of if the nose, the mucous membranes in the nose really become affected um, by drug use. Um, that's an example of an adverse health effect that could happen. But we've seen that addiction, depending on what the drug is, can have far-reaching health uh, problems too, to include cardiovascular disease, stroke, cancer, um, HIV and AIDS, hepatitis B and C, lung diseases for people who primarily smoke the, or snort the drugs, and then also mental disorders can occur. So all of those are side effects. When I talked about HIV and AIDS, hepatitis B and C, those are mostly because of the route that they're taken in getting infectious diseases 
by uh, sharing needles and injecting drugs, for example. So those are, um, and one of the other things we're seeing is that, uh, so if someone takes a prescription medication, there's certain quality standards that are met that have to be done. So the person knows, say they're taking, uh, I don't know, five milligrams of an opiate. They know they're getting five milligrams of an opiate and that's what they're getting because there's very strict quality assurance and quality control that goes with those prescription. But on street drugs and illicit drugs, there is no quality control. So you may be getting, you may think you're getting, for example, someone buys an illicit or um, illegally manufactured oxycodone. They think they're getting five milligrams. They may or may not. They may get more of the opiate is in that, and it may be 20 milligrams. But there also may be other adulterants and for example, I've heard um, things such as rat poison and Drano being put in as adulterants into some of the drugs. And you can well imagine if something's supposed to open a drain or kill a rat, that it definitely is not going to be good for a human. So you really don't know. There were some studies done. And in these studies um, that were done, and they, were, they took street drugs, and this was done in Vermont and Kentucky in 2016 and 2017. And they took 431 samples of illicit street drugs. And every one of those samples had at least one adulterant. Um, let's see, 54% uh, of those drugs had one to four adulterants. 31% uh, had five to eight adulterants, and 15% had nine or more adulterants. So um, these adulterants or mixing agents or cutting agents that were in with these drugs, the people didn't even know what they were getting. And I'll give you one of the examples, and we'll talk a little bit more about this um, as we go on, is there's a drug called fentanyl out there. And fentanyl is um, being found more and more in drugs uh, throughout our state and also throughout the country. But we'll talk about why that becomes important later. Um, one of the other things that we've seen, too, is that with um, women that are pregnant and give birth to babies and those women are addicted to medications, they will have babies that are dependent on whatever that drug was. This is called neonatal abstinence syndrome. And in studies that have been done with babies that are born with neonatal abstinence syndrome, we talked about the genetic predisposition. Now, obviously a newborn, it wasn't their choice to take the drug, so there's not any of those uh, risk factors that we talked about. It's a lot genetics. They found that these babies that had specific genotypes, the AA genotype, that they had longer lengths of stay. They had uh, required more treatment, almost double the amount of treatment, and they also required two or more medications. So that this also does substantiate the genetic um, part of addiction that we see. Um, I'm just going to piggyback on that, um, Terry. Samantha, who also works at Partnership Carson City, um, referred back to naloxone and said um, it is not recommended for pregnant women, probably for the same reasons that you just talked about and the newborn babies. So, Hi, Erin. This is Hannah. I don't know why my name is coming up as Samantha. I just want to be on the oh. <laughs> I am no. the one answering the questions um, in the chat box. So. Okay. It's really great for us, but it's Hannah, not Sam. <laughs> okay, sorry. <laughs> sorry about that. Right. Okay, so I mentioned fentanyl. Um, one of the things that we're seeing um, and we're seeing throughout our state is that fentanyl is being added to medications. So I want to talk a little bit about fentanyl and why that is concerning and worrisome to us for a lot of different reasons. Um, the way that, that uh, opiates are basically determined off their strength is what they call a morphine mill equivalent. So you'll hear MMEs. So um, heroin, for example, would be, let's say, a 101 a morphine mill equivalent to morphine. But with fentanyl, so think of heroin. If someone had heroin, if you went to a restaurant and you got one of those little bags of sugar or stevia or equal, that would be 
let's say a morphine mill equivalent amount of heroin. If they had fentanyl, if you took just maybe a tenth of that bag of equal or sugar, that is how much fentanyl would equal the same amount of, of for that morphine mill equivalent. So you need much, much less of that drug to have the same potency is what I'm saying. So if someone bought a medication or bought, I'm sorry, an illegal drug and they thought they were getting heroin at such a strength and it was really laced with fentanyl, they would be getting like a hundred times the amount of what they thought they were getting because fentanyl is so much stronger. Fentanyl does have a medicinal use. The Drug Enforcement um, Administration does have what they say schedules of drugs. Um, fentanyl is a scheduled drug because it's of its high um, potential for addiction. And, um, but it's used primarily if anyone's ever had surgery and had to go under anesthesia, oftentimes anesthesiologists will give fentanyl. For one, it's for pain control. For two, it also is what they call an amnesiac, so that if you do did have pain, you may forget about that pain. So it does have a medicinal purpose. We do use it. Fentanyl is also used oftentimes for, um, let's say, hospice patients, someone who's um, close to death, to relieve their pain. So we do have a medicinal pur purpose for fentanyl. The problem is with some of the fentanyl that we're seeing, it was manufactured illegally in labs somewhere outside of the United States and brought here. So we don't know, again, that quality assurance isn't there on it. So if they made a whole batch of fentanyl, there, it may be way a lot more of the fentanyl potency in one part of it and less in another. So we don't really know what the potency of that illicit fentanyl is as opposed to the pharmaceutical grade fentanyl. And then recently, we've found another drug um, that's throughout the United States, and it also has been seen here in our state, is carfentanyl. Carfentanyl, so if I use the analogy of an equal packet or a sugar packet for heroin, and then you took a tenth of that, would be the same potency of fentanyl. For carfentanyl, you would take one grain of that, and that's how potent it is. For the DEA scheduling of carfentanil, there is no medicinal use in humans for carfentanil. However, there is a use for carfentanil in veterinary medicine. And the layman's term uh, for what they use carfentanil for is it's called an elephant tranquilizer. So you can imagine if it took an amount of carfentanil to basically anesthetize or tranquilize an elephant if a person took that same amount, it would likely kill them because it's so much more potent. So that's why we're so concerned that these drugs, because someone doesn't even know, oftentimes they're getting this fentanyl or carfentanil, and they're taking the dose of the drug that they normally would take, and they're getting 100 times that with fentanyl or 100 times fentanyl with carfentanil. So it becomes very concerning to us. Um, one of the things that we're seeing, the trends that we're seeing, especially with opiates right now, is that originally it started out with prescription drugs. The prescription drug use is really starting to come down because of um, a, a number of reasons, but um, because of that legislation I talked about with the prescription drug monitoring program we have here in our state, uh, AB 474. So we're seeing it, that curve flattening out and actually starting to come down. But what we're seeing is heroin started in about 2011 to really increase. So people uh, were uh, going to heroin for a number of reasons. It was cheaper or they couldn't get the prescription drugs. So they started using heroin. And that heroin use is starting to level off now. And what we're finding now is that it's really spiking a lot is the use of synthetic opiates and that's those synthetic opiates I talked about of fentanyl and, and carfentanyl. So when we talk, uh, you'll hear me use the term opiates versus opioids. And opioid is a natural occurring. So think of it kind of like organic. It's from the poppy seed and that's what morphine comes from. It's an organic made from a biological material. 
but opiates are also not only those natural occurring, but synthetic, kind of like uh, genetically modified food that you would eat. They're made in a laboratory. So these synthetic opiates are much, much stronger because they do make those in a laboratory. They don't come from that biological source. So we are seeing an uptick in um, overdoses from synthetics because they're much more available and because they are much stronger. What we all are seeing also now, it's kind of been described of the second wave of the opiate crisis, is that um, one thing I didn't tell you that I meant to that I'll talk about now is that as people become addicted to drugs, because it takes so much more of that and they actually see a decrease in the amount of dopamine that's produced in their brain, they start to have a flat affect. So things that would make us happy, like spending time with our family, going out to a nice dinner, um, getting married, whatever it is, they don't get that same level of happiness because the amount of dopamine, remember I told you, was much, much less from those natural occurring things that we do, that they just don't feel it because it's so low compared to their, their brain being flooded with opiates all the time. So you start to see a lot of flat affect, depression, those sort of things. So we started to see an increase in stimulant use. So an increase in cocaine, an in increase in methamphetamine, those sort of things. So we are now seeing and have started to see a spike in the use of cocaine and overdose deaths from cocaine and overdose deaths from methamphetamine. Part of it is too, we are also seeing those drugs laced with opiates and fentanyl and carfentanyl as well. So that's the second wave that we're starting to see from, it was prescription drug first use with um, opiates. The second wave then was uh, illicit drugs with the heroin and the synthetic opiates. And now we're seeing uh, an increase in overdose deaths from these stimulant type drugs. So, um, We've also seen that the number of overdose deaths in the United States outpaces the increase in use. So not as many people are starting to use, but we're seeing more and more um, increase in deaths as opposed to increase in use. In our state, we continue to have a problem with opiates, whether it's heroin or synthetic opiates. But what we're also seeing trends in is the mixing, the poly use. Um, our coroners and medical examiners can't tell us specifically if it's because those drugs were used together or if it's a scenario I described where an opiate was used um, kind of as a downer and then stimulants were used to bring the mood up or um, if it's, you know, and they were used at different times or if they were used at the same time, but we are seeing more and more drugs in the system of people who are overdosed. And some of it may be that someone thought they were taking one specific drug, but they were getting that drug mixed with something else. So on the illicit side of the house. So in Terry, Washoe, yes. Terry, I have a quick question in terms of that. Um, because people are not getting their surgeries and therefore not being prescribed opioids, um, opiates um, as a pain reliever for those types of surgeries while we're in lockdown and all the surgeries kind of have been canceled. Are people turning more towards the cocaine and the heroin, the street drugs, more so than the opiate, opiate use? Uh, I don't know if we have the statistics on that yet from the lockdown, but I can tell you that we have seen um, a significant decrease in the prescribing of opiates uh, as pain medication in our state since that prescription drug monitoring legislation was passed two sessions ago. And um, so there's some speculation that if people cannot get their pain medications, then they're gonna go to the illicit drugs. And we did see an increase most people, it's four out of five, I believe the research shows, four out of five people who are addicted to heroin say they didn't start with heroin, they started with prescription drugs first. So although I haven't seen the statistics since we've been on lockdown from uh, COVID-19, I can imagine that we would probably see something similar to that. 
Um, but uh, going back to the Washoe County um, uh, Medical Examiner's Office provided statistics on drug overdoses from 2012 to 2017. And what uh, Dr. Knight's office found was a 57% increase in drug overdose rates from 2016 to 2017, a 33% increase in opiate related deaths from 2016, there were 52 to 2017, there were 69. And the most common opiates that they were found that were found uh, on autopsy were oxycodone, fentanyl and fentanyl analogs, morphine, and methadone were what they saw out of Washoe County. It's a little bit different down in Clark County um, as to what the coroner is finding down there. And um, the most common that is being seen in Clark County is actually um, the stimulants. There's more stimulant deaths in Clark County than there are from the um, uh, opiates. Uh, let me just move on here for just a second. I'm almost done. Um, we also are seeing an increase in opiate overdose among children. Uh, the statistics um, show that there were uh, these nearly doubled from 2004 to 2015. The um, largest group of overdoses in children, so that's considered anyone under 17, was in the 12 to 17 year olds. But we also saw the three categories of six to 11 year old and one to five year old. And some of the speculation there, especially to the one to five year olds, is it was accidental injection, uh, ingestion of the drugs. So um, I talked about uh, Assembly Bill 474, that's some of the legislation. And then the Good Samaritan Drug Overdose Act um, that were both passed two sessions ago. And I do want to highlight in the Good Samaritan Drug Overdose Act that if what um, a lot of our law enforcement um, investigators were finding is that, and first responders, whether that's fire EMS, is prior to the Good Samaritan Drug Overdose Act, is they would respond to an overdose. And it was very evident the person would be there overdosed by themselves, but it was very evident that they weren't by themselves prior to that. But the people who were um, taking drugs or were there with the person who overdosed would leave out of fear of being arrested for that drug use. So the Good Samaritan Drug Overdose Act made it so that if someone is um, with someone and they overdose, if they call 911 and stay with that person, uh, they will be not be arrested for drugs. It's not to say if they don't have an outstanding warrant for something else that they couldn't be arrested for that outstanding warrant, but just trying, they would rather um, not look at that other drug use and save the life of that person than have everyone leave and let that person die um, out of fear of calling 911. And then also as part of AB 474 and the Good Samaritan Drug um, Overdose Act, it allows our first responders um, as was discussed earlier, that Carson uh, Sheriff Office has naloxone, not only to give out, but they have it for their own officers so they could administer it. And um, the analogy that I use with naloxone administration is it's much like CPR. If any of you uh, know CPR, when you went through your training, they will tell you that the sooner that someone that needs CPR gets CPR, the better their chances of survival are. So it's the same with naloxone. If someone has overdosed on an opiate, the sooner they get that naloxone, the better their chances of survival. So when I first started talking to law enforcement about trying to get them to take naloxone, um, they said, we don't need it. EMS is there shortly after us, typically. EMS is trained to do that, they can do that. But um, sometimes, a minute, two minutes, five minutes can make the difference between life or death for someone who needs um, that life-saving naloxone. So law enforcement does now carry it. I've talked to officers who have, have administered it and um, they will tell you that they wouldn't hesitate to administer it now if it can save someone's life. So that's why I say part of my job is changing hearts and minds and trying to get our first responders and law enforcement to think of addiction as a disorder 
or a brain disease, and then to think of saving lives as opposed to just the criminalization of, of uh, drug use. And Sorry. then, yes. Anna, sorry to interrupt you. It looks like Linda Lang has a question for some of the youth, and she'd really like an answer from you guys because you guys know a lot more than we do sometimes. So the question is, do you think youth are aware of the Good Samaritan Law, um, previous to you telling us about it, Terry? And if no, what ways do you suggest that we get that message out? And so, I like, Hannah, I like that, um, and I did see Linda's um, question, and thank you for responding to that. I told Linda privately, I guess, that I am going to include that question in my evaluation of the presentation, so everybody that's on here will have to do an evaluation. Um, so I will get that information um, documented and get it to you, but um, Terry, thank you for addressing that, because I don't think our students do know that. Yeah. So when I first came into this job and I would go around the state and give presentations, I would always ask the audience, how many of you are aware of the Good Samaritan Drug Overdose Act and that we have it to legislate it within our state? Typically, I'd get one, maybe two hands that would be raised in the room. So I would say most people don't know about it. Um, and that is really where... Um, our partnerships, whenever I do a presentation, I always try to talk about it because it's not gonna do any good if people aren't aware of it. And then out of the great work that the prevention coalitions do um, in getting that out there, I would love, I know there that um, thanks to Mrs. Bean, she allows me to speak to the students, so I talk to them, but I would um, advocate too that it gets added to, to the substance use training that's done in our schools. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, Angie Ma, who teaches at Carson High School, and she's on right now, but she used to teach at the middle school, and she said she used to teach the Good Samaritan Law there, so um, I just don't know how much the middle schoolers' brains take that in and, and understand it, but um, I think it definitely is a thing that we should be pursuing teaching and adding to our curriculum at the high school level. Yeah. And it's also what allows the first responders to carry naloxone as well for the reasons that we talked about. Um, so, um, and I think, I don't remember if it was Hannah or Diana that uh, discussed the Drug Enforcement Administration's National Prescription Drug Take Back Day, which was supposed to be April 25th. But um, unfortunately, like many things because of the COVID-19 uh, restrictions, that was, I don't know if I'd say canceled or postponed, but I know typically in October, there is also um, a drug take back day. And one of my big takeaways that I always like to try to um, at, put as a call to action for everyone is to look through uh, your medic medication uh, at home. And if you have medications that you are no longer using, I don't care, not opiates, any medications, I would say turn those in. Um, usually, uh, I know the coalitions will take um, a lot of the medications. Sheriff's offices, law enforcement usually have drug take back receptacles at their offices that drugs can be dropped off at. And um, I highly suggest that if there are medications that are no longer being used, please get rid of those because we would hate to see those on our streets um, um, being used. I've heard stories of, for example, uh, people are selling their home and they're having an open house in their home and people who aren't even interested in buying the house will come just so they can go through the medication cabinet and steal medications. So not having those if they're not needed. Um, they also lose their point potency. There is an expiration date on medication, so if those aren't being used or they're out of date, please take them. Uh, some of the pharmacies also have uh, drug take-back receptacles, I've noticed, as well. So there are ways, and I think the coalitions, Hannah, you can talk about that, have the Deterra bags and have some of the other ways that you can deactivate the medications, too. Yes, at, at our office, we do have um, Deterra, which is an at-home disposal kit. Um, for any of you know uh, Cruz Bulmer, he works for us. He's a senior at Carson High School, and he actually is the facilitator of the Deterra program. So Deterra is just a little tiny bag 
you can go ahead and put your medications into with a little bit of warm water and it completely deactivates them. So it makes them unusable. Some of the at-home remedies that people used to suggest and that we still suggest if you can't get your hands on doTERRA is um, putting it into kitty litter or to coffee grounds. What we found is that really desperate users actually siphon the medications out of that kitty litter or out of those coffee grinds. So doTERRA, just like naloxone, is available for free at our office and we're more than happy to mail those to you as well, um, especially because we didn't have the prescription drug roundup this April. Um, if you have family or you yourself are taking medications and you need to get rid of them, just let us know and we can give them to you. Yeah, yeah Cruz, um, Cruz also came into all my health classes this um, semester and did a presentation on that doTERRA and he did a really good job with that. So he's a really good advocate for um, that as well as for Partnership Carson City and getting the word out that that is available there. So we appreciate to add, it. To, to add to what Hannah said, I was just going to say is um, do use these mechanisms, whether it's a drug take back days, putting them in the receptacles or using the chair bags. Please don't just flush them down the toilet because what EPA has found is that there are, when that gets done, there are increasing amounts of uh, medications that end up in our water because through our sewage treatment plants and all that, they don't necessarily filter out those medications. So don't just flush them down the toilet. Take a Hannah up on her uh, offer of the Tatera bags or take them to one of the drug take back receptacles. For more education on how to, oh, sorry, I have a child talking in the background. For more education on how to dispose of drugs properly, I did go ahead and paste the Partnership Carson City link um, down in the bottom of the chat for you. So I invite you to go ahead and visit that and you can learn how to safely dispose of your medications. Also, I have a quick question, Terry. Um, when people are not, like during this COVID-19 and we're all in um, social isolation, um, and people aren't able to go to the doctor because they're doing teledoc um, appointments and not getting prescribed drugs. Um, do you think they would want to help those who really need it stop from doing street drugs? Like, is there are there programs like addiction programs available even during lockdown, like when we're supposed to be staying at home? So thank you for that question. It's a great segue into some of the stuff I wanted to talk about for what our state is doing. Uh, under Governor Sisolak. He has his health advisory team. He also has a behavioral health advisory team. And as part of that, a couple of things, there's a disaster behavioral health response plans that have been put in place throughout the state. Um, the American Red Cross and CASAT, who you've already heard about up at UNR, have also trained um, well over 100 people in psychological first aid. Psychological first aid is basically for non-behavioral health professionals um, that can support family and friends through crisis situations, which would be an example in the question. Um, $1.9 million was provided to our state through a SAMHSA COVID response grant. And as part of that, it's the establishment of a couple of different things. There's a child's mobile crisis response. This isn't just for drugs, it's also for mental health crisis. There was a gr grant provided to the University of Nevada, Las Vegas uh, psychology department to set up a helpline. There um, also Desert Park and Reno Behavioral Health um, I have established crisis triage centers where someone can go into those crisis triage centers as well. And then also to establish in our state what they're calling the crisis now model. Crisis now model is again for mental health and also substance use. And it's basically a model that's um, being implemented so that people can get the level of help that they need. And what I mean by that is Currently, our model in dealing with substance use and mental health in someone in a crisis is to either take them to the emergency department or take them to jail. And um, those aren't the only two options that are available. Sometimes people in crisis maybe just need someone to talk to. They may need some resources, like for example, in the question that you had, they may need resources of being able to get their medication or get into treatment, those sort of things. So this crisis now model 
is really geared at getting people the resources they need as opposed to just taking them to the emergency department or taking them to jail. So that's another part of that SAMHSA grant. Um, also, through our prevention coalition, such as Partnership Carson City, really trying to do so more substance abuse and prevention activities, such as what they did tonight. Um, there's also a PSA that's gonna be coming out, a public service announcement. It's called Home But Not Alone, and it will talk about the crisis hotline that's been developed that people can call into. There's also support for behavioral health providers for the use of telehealth and telemedicine. Um, we also, through our opiate programs, we have what we call OTP, those are opiate treatment programs. And through those, um, both DEA and SAMHSA have really looked at the prescribing and dispensing of medications so that um, previously someone would, let's say, have to go into this OTP every day to get their medications to get them through. Now they are prescribing, let's say, maybe 14 days worth at a time so the person doesn't have to go in and doing counseling sessions via telehealth. There are also warm uh, lines that have been set up by the National Alliance on Mental Health um, and our Foundation for Recovery is providing, they have a crisis support too for peer recovery support programs. So this has all been since the restrictions from COVID-19 um, and that things that have been put in place in our state because of this behavioral health advisory team. That's all I have if there's any other questions. Um, I wanted, here, oh, Terry, ahead. I just wanted to ask if you could send me some of those resources that you just um, listed off and talked about, that PSA video I'd like to post in my um, classes just so they, so that students or their parents or cousins or relatives might um, need that resource. But I, I'm a big advocate for providing resources for students um, pertaining mm -hmm. to health. So if you could send me that list, that would be fabulous. Sure, no problem. I want to thank you guys for giving me your time tonight and let me talk to you about this because as I said, I feel like my job description is changing hearts and minds. So I think um, as we are, are better educated on all of this, the better job we'll do in responding to it. Yeah, I want to thank all my um, students that were on here and Partnership Carson City again for um, doing this with me. I think it's important. And um, like I said, we originally had these scheduled at the high school and the library for parents and students to attend. And we pushed through and made it happen. So I appreciate, Terry, you sticking with us and um, coming on and doing this tonight, as well as Partnership Carson City to be able to provide the, um, the Zoom video link and um, the support for this. And like I said, my students and all those, all the others that joined, I appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you, Erin. And one last word to all of you youth. We just wanna remind you that we do have other opportunities for you to be involved in while you're stuck at home. Every Monday night at 5.15, we have virtual yoga. Um, that is why I'm in my yoga gear right now as I meet with you guys. It's really wonderful. A lot of people are on it. You don't have to be on video. Um, and the link is on our website and our Instagram. So please go ahead and join us. It'll be really good for your minds, your bodies, um, you know, and for your family too. And that virtual yoga also is awesome because they record it. And so when I get up in the morning at 530, I jump on and I do the yoga in the morning in my living room and I, I just can't do it on Monday nights, but it's recorded. So it's a good, um, good way to exercise your body and breathe. <laughs> All right, so if you guys have no other questions, I don't see any posted in here. Um, again, I appreciate in partnership Carson City. Terry, I appreciate you and your time, and um, you guys are feel free to leave. If you have any other questions, go ahead and email me, and I'll get those answered, or I'll send them to Terry or partnership Carson City. But thanks again for coming. Thank you. Stay safe and well. You too.